Okay. So we um, we did this talk actually last year with Kathleen as the moderator and me as one of the guests. And we get to all switch around. I get to be the moderator this time and ask the questions. And I've got Kirsten, Lauren with me here. I'll let them each do an introduction and then I'll blab on in my not Australian accent. Please keep uh, the accent going. And it's the most interesting thing we have. Yeah, it's the on. most interesting. I thought you were going to say it's the most interesting thing about me. Yes. And actually, some people do find that. So mm -hmm. that's OK. Um, yeah, so ladies, after you. All right, I'll start with, can we all give a shout out to Kathleen Smith, who's not physically with us. She's here in love and spirit and higher ground is her baby. So. We're, she's probably watching this, so we should like wave. We love you. We love you, we miss you. Okay. I am Kirsten Renner, also known as Krenner. I had cooler handles back in the day, but they didn't stick and that's sad. Uh, I've been recruiting for decades, and although I'm not currently recruiting, I stay very engaged in talent and what makes it work. So hope this is uh, fulfilling for all of you, and we'll be here for questions afterwards. Hello, I'm Lauren Shear. I had not heard of this conference until about two months ago. <laughs> Kathleen reached out to me, so super excited to be here and you know get to know all of you and be a part of this. Um, but I am a talent acquisition business partner, which is a fancy name for a recruiter at Aristocrat. I've been in recruiting for about seven years now. Um, been in Las Vegas the whole time. I'm born and raised, and I went to UNLV. And do you have a nickname? <laughs> all right, no, so so no. I challenge you all throughout <laughs> this discussion to think about what handle we should give her. She's this is her first con, yes. right? You 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 deserve a handle. So we're going to figure you. one out for you. By the way, she whipped up this slide really quick. We showed up without slides, so keep that in mind when <laughs> solutions provider. There we go. Um, I'm Chris Rides. I'm the president of Via Resource. That's quite a new title for me, actually. Uh, I founded a company called Tyro Security about 10 years ago, a professional services company and a cybersecurity recruitment company. I just merged the uh, recruiting arm with Via Resource that is a British firm. Uh, actually, one of my friends started uh, back there. That's, they've been going for 12 years. So we merged together. We cover the UK, Europe, Middle East, and here in the United States. Uh, I've been involved in the industry for quite a while now. Uh, founded uh, the cloud, one of the founding directors of the Cloud Security Alliance, Los Angeles chapter, and a couple of times have been president and been involved with B sides for a long time and some of the other conferences and love it. And my nickname, actually, that nobody uses here is Ride Z. That was it, Ride Z. Everybody called me Ride Z. And then, you know, when I'm in trouble with my mum and dad, they call me Christopher. That's as we all know, that's when we know we're in trouble. So let's, let's jump into the questions. Uh, first things first, what is the difference between a direct recruiters and staffing firms? Kirsten, do you wanna have a go at this one? I'll have a go. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. The difference between uh, like an internal corporate recruiter and a staffing firm. Yeah. Um, I think the, and the, there's going to be out this might be I should have read the questions I'm not gonna I'm gonna try not to go into what I think might be one of the next questions because there's <laughs> reasons to use both I highly encourage um, taking advantage of both but the corporate recruiter is is working obviously directly for the hiring organization whereas the agency recruiter they are uh, they are working for multiple hiring organizations, right? So they're almost like your agent. They're like your Jerry Maguire, right? They are, um, they're, they're your agent. They're fighting for you to explore multiple different hiring organizations. So hopefully that makes sense. And raise your hand if it doesn't. Yeah, and I can elaborate on that. So I'm an in-house recruiter. Um, so I work specifically for aristocrats. So any positions that I'm filling are going to be for aristocrat, right? Um, but we sometimes as recruiters cannot fill positions. So we actually use agencies to support our hiring as well. Um, so I have you know, a relationship with five different local agencies and I'll reach out to them depending on the type of role I'm filling. So sometimes you know, when you guys are getting contacted on LinkedIn, 
different things like that, email. It could be a direct recruiter right from the company, but it could also be an agency. So if you're ever not sure, you can always look up that company that they're reaching out to you from and find out. Either way, it, it's a good thing to be contacted. Yeah, why not, right? Keep your Side options note, open. He, yes. uh, uh, we're very, very selective at Accenture where I work about who, what agencies we'll work with, and we work with his agency because they're really good. <laughs> so <laughs> we're getting there. <laughs> Thanks for saying that. It doesn't come across so well when I just say it about myself, it's, right? It's true. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it's so I've been in on the agency side of recruiting myself uh, for this is my 24th year. I know what you're thinking, Chris, you look so young. There's no way. How could that possibly be? Yeah, or maybe not. Got lots <laughs> of gray hair. Um, but it, it's really interesting. We work with multiple clients, uh, as these guys mentioned. We, we actually find that our best relationships with our best clients are when we've got recruiters internally that we work really well with. Um, and so that's really important. If I look at our relationships with our best clients, it's ones where the recruiters want us involved. They, uh, we, we work together in a partnership. We learn about the company, so we're an extension of them. Um, so yeah, that's a, a big difference. You can often ask them, and, and often they'll tell you as well whether they're working with multiple roles or not. Um, so yes, so there's some differences there. Uh, and then we went on a little bit as to why, we, why you might use one or, or another, but I think going off onto sort of outreach, like interview processes, that sort of thing. Can you guys describe what your process looks like in, in your businesses? So the initial outreach, recruitment, interview and onboarding practices, and I'm happy to share what it looks like from a, a, an external third party recruiter. Okay. Um, so I'll say like in a perfect world situation as a recruiter, so I will post the job I'll work with the hiring manager who could be anywhere from a supervisor, manager, director, VP, depends on the level, but we always call them hiring managers. Um, and they will you know, give us their qualifications, what they're really looking for in that perfect candidate. So I go out, I look either on LinkedIn, if I'm not seeing the talent come through our application system, but if I do see the talent, right, that's the perfect world scenario, um, I can find the candidate I need. So usually, candidates um, will be reached out to by a recruiter. Um, they'll have a phone screen, which is usually just a 20 minute phone call. Um, from there, if I confirm qualifications meet, salary expectations align, um, you know, all, all the boxes are checked, then we'll move you forward to a hiring manager interview. Um, that can either be just very like behavioral focused or sometimes that's really technically focused, right? We wanna check the technical qualifications before then getting you in front of maybe the second round or final rounds where you're meeting with maybe higher ups or different team members or sometimes we'll do like partners that you'd be working for in the business. Um, so just people you'd be working with, basically, right? We want to make sure you're getting to know the company, the culture, um, understanding what we're really, really looking for in the perfect candidate, but also giving us the opportunity as the business to really get to know you and what you could provide as well. Um, and so all throughout, I'd say it depends on the role, right? Um, some positions move really quickly. People aren't on vacation. <laughs> we can, you know, have that perfect process. So I'd say anywhere from like when you apply, it could be two weeks, at very very quickly, right? Um, but I'd say plan for like an eight-week process. So similarly, uh, when the when the hiring team identifies that there's a hiring need, they're, they're either it's internal on their team internally or it's a customer need. The customer comes to them and says, here's what I need, here's how many positions there are. The recruiting team will start doing intake calls with those managers to understand the position. Now, if it's a brand new position they've never done before, they have to do an intake to understand the requirements. They wanna know all the nooks and crannies, every little detail, like if I'm doing an intake, or one of my recruiters is doing an intake. I want to know everything. I want to know what the work environment is. I want to know what the team looks like. I want to know what parking is like. I want to know everything about it so I can put it in the in the like cell area of the requisition. So we so the recruiter can really speak to the position. But then when the recruiter starts sourcing and in getting in touch with people. So there's a big difference between when a recruiter starts to search for the people that they think meets the requirements and then actually getting in touch with them, getting a response from them. There could be a huge gap in, in between there. Also, 
uh, because we have relationships with agencies, we're doing intakes with them too. Take the time to speak with them and, and so that they understand. Uh, a lot of agencies that are doing I don't know what the term for it is, but where they're just like throwing stuff at the wall and they're like, uh, <laughs> I'm going out there. And, and this is this is this is typical. That's why they're atypical is those agencies are looking for their shot. They're going to look at the company names. They're going to look at their job postings and they're going to start doing searches. I call it an unauthorized search. Right. Um, so it makes sense if you go back to one of her original points when you're the candidate, ask, uh, are you do you work for the hiring organization? or not, right? So just so you know what you're doing. And then the recruiters should build a profile for the individual. So they shouldn't be just thinking about the job. In my mind, as a recruiter, to do the best job, you should not be trying to fill the job. You should be speaking to the human being, finding out what they really care about, what they really want, what they really need, what really makes them tick. And then you've built a profile for them. And then you kind of do some searching for them too. There's going to be things that you're aware of or that you become made aware of on the recruiting side that before it ever goes gets posted or before the requisition ever gets submitted, you realize that team XYZ is either going after this big proposal or they just won this new piece of work. So you think of that candidate. You have such a good relationship with them and you keep them tight in your particular pipeline that you know, you know what, and you say to them, I noticed that you applied for ABC. However, here's this other thing I want you to keep in mind, or here's this other team that might work good for you. So I want the recruiters to, and they do, take it to the next level and really care about the human and really be actively helping them seek out what would be the best fit for them. So the process, I can't put a timeline on it because it, and it, it, sometimes it takes months and it should, right? Because you don't want to be force fit into the first thing that you check the boxes for you want to be you want to be matched up like as if it were dating not that i had dating experience but if i did i would imagine that i would want to get matched up with something that's going to last for a long time so no hookups <laughs> i am um, yeah and 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 i think well i mean i i don't want to put pressure on on Accenture, but our last placement with them, I think we had an offer. Uh, it was like a week and a half. Like we had a verbal offer. Like so, things happened really quickly. So they can happen super quickly in all sorts of businesses. That's impressive. Yeah, that's it's very fast. There you go. Is that you, Drake? Did you do that? That problem. <laughs> <laughs> so things things can happen really quick. And he's hiring, um, Ben. Yeah. Sorry. Drake in the white hat. <laughs> um, yeah, we we. Like we, we have clients with all sorts of uh, different lengths from fangs where we are seriously talking about months, like nobody's getting a quick job uh, at some of those. Um, and then to startups where we're helping to build go to market teams or you know, we work with cybersecurity startups. So some of those, if they're in their early stages, seed or series A, they might not even have an internal recruiter yet. So we, we are their internal recruiter and, and I, can think of one where we sent the resume on the Wednesday, they interviewed the person on the Friday, uh, then they met the person for dinner Saturday, and the person had a written offer on Sunday and sent it back Sunday afternoon. So things can happen, like that is insane, I would just say. <laughs> you know, long time in recruitment, I don't see that very often, but things can happen that quickly. Um, and, and so, you know, you never know when, you know, you might have been looking for a role for a while and then all of a sudden things can change tomorrow. So it's important to, it's one of the reasons why it's really important to stay very positive during your job search because things can rapidly change. Uh, in terms of the process, our process pretty much follows exactly what Lauren and Kirsten have, uh, have said. We're, we're talking about uh, us initially taking the job description. Um, usually it's uh, with a hiring manager and perhaps one of the internal recruiters on board and we'll go through because um, quite often some of the job descriptions that we see uh, and what people are actually looking for there might be a little bit of a difference there and so we might ask things like right when you get your very first resume what are the things you're looking for and it's funny how you ask those questions and actually what they're looking for isn't the things that are at the top of the job description necessarily um, and so we can find out lots of information by following through little processes like that and getting to try and get in the minds of, of uh, different hiring managers. We also work a little with the process. So we might find out 
who else is involved in the process. Um, if we get an opportunity to speak to everybody in the process, which is rare, but if we do, it's making sure that everybody's on, you know, looking at the same, uh, looking for the same type of person. And then one of the key things I always say to people is try and make sure that if it's your process, make sure everybody in that process understands what their job is or what their role is in the process. You look like you're gonna add something there. Yeah, like I was sparking my eye. To include, um, you are part of the process. Right. You, the candidate, are part of the process. So so I encourage you as you're rolling through the different stages that she was describing to say, what can I expect next? Next. And some recruiters, uh, I was one of them that was very poor at um, not dropping the ball, not intentionally in my heart. I wanted to never drop the ball. So don't be afraid to reach out to the recruiter and say, I haven't heard. Should I be concerned? Right. Um, sometimes it, 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 it's, it's, it's not intentional, right? It just depends on the volume and it depends on what's happening. But if it seems like things are, are taking too long, uh, reach out, reach out and, and find out and, and ask as you're going through the stages that she was describing. So, okay, I had this. When should I expect to get that next phone call or when should I expect for the offer to, to come in my hand? Probably not on a Sunday most of the time. <laughs> no, no. Yeah. And, and, uh, it is one of those things where like we'll try and like manage your expectations we want you to have a rough understanding so it's not like tomorrow okay well you said last time this this person got an offer you know on a sunday well where's my offer okay well let's so it's not always the same so we try and manage expectations where we can um and and every recruitment even within a, a business every recruitment process will will differ a little so hiring managers might have their own processes um, as I said, they might look for different things on, on resumes. So you just got to be aware that everything kind of can slightly change. Um, and on that, to add, we are all humans, so we do make mistakes, right? Um, we generally, the people that I know and respect don't ghost people, right? If you don't get a message back, it's because we didn't see your message in the first place. You got to bear in mind that um, even uh, a year ago when when the market was really tight in cybersecurity, uh, there was still you know we'd get quite a lot of job um, applications and if you're looking for a senior person we'd get quite a lot of job applications from people trying to enter the industry and so that that gives us quite a lot of people to get through and right now uh, I think we're probably seeing like a tenfold increase because of people that have been involved in in you know rifts and been laid off you know, they're applying for jobs that maybe they wouldn't typically apply for if they were in a job. And so that means that the volume of people applying have gone up and it's much harder to, to find the people in, in that big pile of resumes. Um, so I think while we're talking about resumes, this might be a good way to maybe dissect, you know, what great tips you have on, uh, on writing resumes, what people should do, what they shouldn't do, how the AT ATS systems may or may not work, all of this juicy stuff that people are always busy trying to hack the system, right? Lauren? So my biggest thing with resumes is you don't want the recruiter to have to ask a question, right? So if I'm a recruiter and I have you know, 30 applications for a data engineer, right? I have to go look at every single one of those resumes and see the skills, the years, what companies they've been working for. On average, I always forget, I think it's like 45 seconds we look at a resume, something close to that. Um, and that's 100% true, right? Like we, we meet with the hiring manager during that intake call. I get like the five top skills they need, the years of experience, and that's what I'm looking at a resume. I'm not reading every single bullet point. I'm looking at the number and what's supposed to be there. If it's not there, you don't meet the qualifications and I'm moving forward, right? So my biggest thing is making sure you have the right information and the way you know that you have the right information is by looking at the job description before you apply. We get so many candidates who just apply and they just see the job title and then when I'm on the phone with them, they don't even know what job they're interviewing for, which is a really big turnoff, so don't do that. Um, but yeah, you know, read the job description. It should say clearly, like, you need three years of experience. Okay, if you have three years of experience, make sure I can very easily see that on your resume. Um, if you need Python, make sure that's listed. I always love a resume where, 
at the top. And I think this might be like controversial, but sometimes people will have a summary at the top. They'll have a goal. They'll have, they'll have an objective statement. I say it's great because it can really highlight, hey, like I'm a data engineer with four plus years of experience. My main skills are X, Y, Z, and I'm looking for a new opportunity because X, right? Um, that just lays it out for me. I don't have to really follow up and ask any questions and you're making my job really easy. Um, so that's my biggest thing, right? Like look at the job description, see what it's asking for, see if you have those skills and that experience, and then make sure it's being shown on your resume. Um, another big thing for me is clear formatting. And that's just again, so it's easy to read, right? Make sure your format looks nice, things are outlined well, it's clear where it's, you know, you have an education title, you have your professional experience title, you have your skills, like I can easily navigate your resume. Um, and in my opinion, we'll see what everybody else thinks, <laughs> but um, I like a one page resume because again, it's all right there. Um, some, I, I've gotten 10 page resumes and it's just like, what are we doing, right? Like I don't need your whole life. This is way too much. Um, and I'm not gonna read it all, right? Um, so you wanna put as like much content in a like precise, like summarized way um, in one page if you can. I always say like, okay, if you're an executive, you have years of experience, you know, you've done a lot, you're serving on boards, like yes, two pages is fine, but I don't think a resume should ever be more than two. Do you agree? <laughs> <laughs> I do not, but that's okay. Yeah because I'm technically not a recruiter um, <laughs> anymore. Um, but everything you said made absolutely makes sense. Um, I don't want to steal his thunder. Drake's talking at two o'clock about career development and he has a whole section on resumes and he's really good at um, helping people rewrite their resumes. Uh, there are services for writing your resumes. I don't, I do sorry for people. Oh shit, I was just about to say sorry if you pay, if people pay, I, I, I wouldn't pay. Um, but um, yeah, so I, a good recruiter is going to help you redo your resume. However, one point that she made that is that is very valid and fair is you get resume fatigue. You can only read so much, right? Although I'm not going to say this is the, the number of pages you should have or you're allowed to have, um, uh, it, it gets to the point where it's impossible to, to limit it to a certain number of pages. Um, you should be ready to customize it per the job. Every compliant job rec has to tell you the difference between what is required and what is preferred. So let me say that one more time. A compliant job requisition makes it very clear, this is required, this is preferred. So hopefully the employer did that. Now you know. However, I also believe there's a way around almost everything, right? You know, gotta understand enough about what you're looking for that you can speak to your equivalent experience, right? Um, I don't want to screw this up and get it technically wrong because I um, <clears throat> I'm not tech, super technical. But if it I don't know if it says you have to have a specific, if it says you have to have JavaScript, but you have Perl, right? Speak to that, right? That's just a random example. Um, I think that uh, your resume. I if you if, if I said you, I could only tell you one thing, it starts with one sentence. It does not have to be a, a dissertation. I'm a this and I want to be a that. Never assume that the person who sees your resume, because it has to go through layers, depending on the size of the organization, you may have to get through multiple layers before a recruiter sees it, then before a hiring manager sees it. And it might even go through some filters on applicant tracking systems, most of which, by the way, are very awful, right? So you might have just gotten filtered out because of this stupid technology, right? So say I am a systems engineer looking to get into a solutions architect job. Hard stop, now I know. Now I don't have to try to figure out by looking at the multiple things that you've done over multiple years. I wonder what this person wants to do next. If you tell me, then I'm gonna dig a little deeper. So she said she's not gonna read all the pages, neither am I. But if I know that you want to do the thing I need you to do, now I am compelled to read for longer than three seconds, than five seconds, than 30 seconds. So you're going to customize it. You're going to start off with it exactly what I want to be. And then also keep one more thing in mind that those applicant tracking systems, some of them, 
get confused if you put fancy graphics on your resume if you put little boxes or and i've i've made this columns <laughs> please stop with the columns if you put little squares around it or whatever the more you put in your resume that isn't a letter a character it, it, the the applicant tracking system is just going to not understand and it's going to reformat it and then we never see it um i feel like i definitely had something else but i can't remember can i add something real fast yeah go for it yeah, I was just going to say, like, you know, we read them very quickly, right? We're looking at the qualifications, but I do want to say, like, everything that's on your resume does matter because what's going to happen is if I see you meet the qualifications, I'm compelled to keep reading. Now do you have the preferred? Do you have those, like, great things that the hiring manager is also asking for? And then if it's a, like, yes, and I think I have a really great resume, I'm going to send it to the hiring manager right away, and they're going to read probably every bullet and really learn about your background and be prepared to really dive into that um, when you have that. So I don't want to, you know, disregard like all the other content and when you put time into writing those bullets explaining you know the impact you made in your position and what you were doing in your jobs um, because that that information is important it's just as a recruiter when we get that resume it's we're really just skimming it yeah i'm gonna i'll tell you a story about that because i know it upsets people some people that, that we don't read the whole of your resume um and i know it's really important to you it's your career um the better your resume is written, the more of it that's going to get read. Uh, I had um, I had a security person send me a 55-page resume, and uh, obviously I opened it up. Yeah, that is too much. Um, I opened it up and I was like, "Whoa, okay." And so I spoke to them on the phone, and I was like, "Yeah, dancing around a little bit." And I was just like, "Okay, so is, have you got uh, like another resume?" Because a lot of people have more than one resume, right? You have a general resume, you have something that. Like people sometimes have, I've got something that goes through ATSs and, and stuff. I, we'll talk about that in a minute. But um, and the person responded said, "Yes, I can send it across to you." I said, "Brilliant, send it across to me, and then we'll arrange another call." Seventy pages, the second resume. So yeah, this this is not a made up story. Um, and so I had a conversation with them, and and the person got really offended and basically said to me, "If uh, look, if the client's not willing to spend the time to read through my resume and understand my experience, I don't want to work there." To which I said, OK, I understand. And that was the last time we spoke. I don't know where they're working. Um, but what I will say is you've got to think that, you know, part of your job may well be writing reports, right? Being concise, being able to put information down that's understandable. And if you want to increase your career and move up to executive levels, you've got to be able to write executive summaries, right? So if your resume is this huge, long document, the first question I would ask as a hiring manager would be, can they not do this concisely, right? Can they not get the information across? And so I would say that I think one pages are fine if you're uh, early stage uh, in your career. And, and also it's different industries as well. You know, if you're a marketing person, you might have a, a much nicer graphic -y resume. It might be a bit different. From a cybersecurity point of view, if you've got experience, you're gonna probably want something that's readable and it's at least two pages. I haven't got a huge, I don't get hugely upset if it, it runs to three. Two to three is your ideal. Um, ways you can cut that down, anything over 10 years ago, you probably can just put your job title, the place you worked and, and the dates you worked and that's enough. Um, I agree with the summary. Sometimes we, for some clients, they request that we add a page. Uh, I know that sounds strange, but what we have to do is qualify the candidate. And in that summary page, we summarize how we qualified them, why they're looking to move, what are going to be the buttons that are going to get them to make that move, um, salary, you know, location, all of these sort of things. So, um, And some of the stuff uh, that Lauren talked about in that first sentence covers that. And what you want is you want somebody buying into it. You're trying to catch their attention so they do spend the extra time. So that's just my little sort of tips on, on resumes and, and, and things. I think you've got to remember a resume actually probably doesn't get you the job, but it is designed to get you the interview. And that's the key. So if you're writing something that, that, that works for an ATS, has loads of like the random words written or something on it, you've got to bear in mind that if, you, if it's successful and it gets you through the ATS, the first person that reads it's going to be like this is a mess like and not want to spend any more time so you're you're just getting yourself along the process one tiny step but then you're going to cut yourself out of it anyway so just think about it from a hiring manager's point of view i have the job description here i have my resume here would i want to interview myself are there any projects i've done that are relevant just for this job and as kirsten said 
every time, right? Every time, new resume for a job. And I know that makes it difficult if you're applying for a lot of jobs, but you're much better applying for a lesser amount of jobs and, and, and sending quality resumes than you are doing it the other way around. I have one go back. Uh, if you know that what you have on paper looks like it might not be a match, but you hope you get the opportunity to explain why you feel you're qualified, right? You can think of a million examples. I would then go to LinkedIn and I would look for, you know, you can search by title or you could search by name when you look for the employer that's hiring. I would look for people with the title recruiter and I would say, I noticed you're hiring for this. I applied. Please let me know if there's anything else you need from me. Something to that effect, right? Um, if that doesn't work, you could do the same thing with whoever you think might be the hiring manager in that team. But, but that might be just what you need to get bumped up to get, they're going to go maybe even look in the applicant pool that they haven't even had a chance to look at yet. And that is also your opportunity to say, I noticed you're hiring for ABC, which requires blah, blah, blah. Uh, you're not going to see that on res my resume, but here's what you will see, or here's what I'd like you to keep in mind. Keep it short, right? But that's going to be the trigger to compel them to take a look, right? So especially if they have something automated set up that is going through the applicant pool and filtering out the people who don't have that keyword that you don't have, but you have something equivalent that you want to speak to, that is your opportunity to do that in your in a personal message to the recruiting team. And, and I know in our industry, not everybody like loves social media or putting a lot of information on, but uh, honestly, you're, you're finding a role for yourself is much easier if you've got a LinkedIn, um, you're you know, whether you, whether you like it or not, that's just how it is. Um, maybe at some point we'll see people using them completely instead of resumes. We've had a couple of clients do that, um, but it's really rare. Nobody's doing it really that way yet. Yeah, I was gonna say like, I know I'm big on the one or two or even three pages for your resume. <laughs> if you want to talk about yourself and you want to put everything you've ever done, LinkedIn is a hundred percent that place to do it. Include your LinkedIn um, profile, you know, URL, make sure it's professional at the top and that it works. There's so many times I go click on a link and I'm excited to look at their profile and it doesn't work. Um, but yeah, I, I source a lot and LinkedIn is the number one place I go to source. So we have a thing called LinkedIn Recruiter, right? So that's like the back end side and I can search by location, keywords, skill sets, years of experience, university, like they're endless, right? So anything that you're putting on your profile, I can search and it's either gonna bring you into my search or remove you. So the more information you guys can be putting on LinkedIn, the more likely you are to be found on LinkedIn as well. And if you want an idea of um, how effective that is, uh, a LinkedIn recruiter, if, you, if any of you have sort of had a sales navigator license or something to allow you to send messages, uh, recruiter licenses are between six and seven hundred dollars a month for one person. And they generally don't do much discounting. So if you've got a, a big recruitment company with a hundred people, you're paying a hundred times that. So if there's that kind of value being put on it, that's why they're going to make use of that tool. So, all right, good. Um, have you found some ways that job seekers don't prepare very well for interviews? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> There's some people that are very prepared and some that are not. Um, where to start? So, I mean, in general, we'll say like with a recruiter screen, right? That's how you're going to get your foot in the door and get that opportunity to talk with the hiring manager. Do your research on the company. Whenever I'm talking to hiring managers in that intake meeting, I ask them, are there any questions you want me to screen them on um, other than just the basic qualifications? Because really that's the purpose of the call for the recruiter is, hey, do you meet, you know, are you crazy? You're a normal person? Okay, let's proceed, right? Um, so I'll always ask, like, is there anything else? And if it's a leadership role, like they might say, ask them their leadership style, right? Like how do they lead their teams or how many direct reports have they had? Um, if it's like a data engineer, right? And they're a really close knit team and they work really well together, like that teamwork's gonna be important. So they might ask me to kind of dive into their teamwork and how they like working with others. Um, so being prepared to talk about your experience, but more importantly about the company and the role and show that you actually read the job description and what it entails and 
also be prepared to ask questions. If I, you know, as a recruiter, it's my job to make sure you don't really have any questions and I'm setting expectations. So I love when they are like, oh, well, you answered all my questions. I actually don't have any. I'm like, cool, I did my job. But be prepared with questions as easy as, why do you like working for the company? Cool, I can always talk about that. And it's gonna give me the opportunity to get you excited about the position or what's the culture like or what's the hiring manager like what's their leadership style you know how do they work um you can come up with a list of 50 questions if you really wanted so when people tell me they don't have any questions i automatically think you're not actually interested or really care about this role and i get the same feedback from my hiring managers if a candidate doesn't ask questions at the end they're like i don't think they really care about this opportunity they didn't ask me anything i'm like Okay, um, another thing with preparation, I know Zoom, like right, video calls or video interviews are really, really big. Um, I always get feedback like, oh, they were sitting in their car on their phone. I'm like, oh, like that stinks. They really didn't take the time to prepare, find a quiet space so that there were no distractions. Um, so it's, it's all the things, right? It's how you're talking, how you're preparing for it, but also your setting. What are you wearing? You know, everything you're doing is showing the person how much you care about the role. Um, and then that like smiling is important, right? You want to smile. It makes them smile. And um, yeah, I think I think that's it. I'll hand it over. <laughs> okay. Um, I hope I remember everything. A uh, couple things. I just just a just a side point. Uh, there are people who work in specific work locations where uh, going to the car is the only choice they have. Um, there's also situations where they can't get on camera. I coach my managers to understand that a it might be because of the limitations within their work environment and or they should be if they're not comfortable getting on camera this is super controversial opinion via Kirsten do not judge what could you possibly as a hiring manager ascertain from physically seeing someone in my opinion no bona fide occupational qualification can be measured by what you look like if you're not comfortable that's okay with me and I coach my managers to get over it. That's just me. And plus, I literally have people who work for customers where the best they can do is, is take a train to a shuttle, to a car, to a parking lot to talk for five minutes on their phone. And that's the best they can do. I just wanted to make that I do understand that that's a thing. Um, and I, I, I'm highly supportive um, of the neurodivergent community as well that may very well just need it to be a certain kind of way for them. And you should accommodate that managers should accommodate that. Sorry, I just got like a little emotional um, about that. So um, I got Can I ask a question? Of course. Would you agree though that as the candidate, like it's your job to set that expectation, right? So, I mean, if a candidate ever said like, hey, I don't feel comfortable being on camera, I'd say, okay, cool. Thank you for letting me know. I'll let the hiring manager know and we'd continue in that process. Absolutely. But I think if you were to just like it, it's setting expectations, I guess, right? And presenting yourself it go, the right Yeah, it way. goes both ways, right? So she as the recruiter or you as the candidate are going to let each other know so that no bad assumptions are made, right? Yeah. Just let each other know. It take, You know, it's, it's a personal situation. Let each other know. Um, I love that she talked, that Lauren talked about questions. Questions are important. I think that you, the candidate, should take that opportunity, and we'll talk about this more at 2 o'clock, but take that opportunity when you are offered questions to turn the conversation into a personal conversation that you're having, this may be the most important revealing part of all the interviews that take place, particularly with the managers more than the recruiters. This is when you're going to say, what did, what have you learned? Why did you choose to work here? And also, especially, especially important, uh, I heard someone say something with regard to managers. It's not their job to promote people. I personally believe, and I learned this in um, manager, it, going into a manager role and then an executive role that that my most important job is to promote the people under me literally nothing else matters and I, and, and you got to give me one quick second I'm sorry timer guy um, <laughs> there was a time when I when I rolled in and I was trying to impress my boss and we were looking for uh, I don't know we were looking for an elastic engineer we were looking for something nobody could find and my team couldn't do it sorry buddy and I walked in uh, and I was like Guess he found an elastic engineer. And he goes, and I thought I was, he was going to go, you are so amazing. And he goes, that's not your job. I was like, damn. But it isn't my job. 
it is not the manager's job ever to take credit for anything. And their greatest responsibility all the way up the chain is to lift up their team. So ask those people on the hiring team who they have promoted and what opportunities they have created. That's very important for you as a candidate to figure out, can I grow in this place, in my opinion? Yeah, I agree. That's, I mean, that's good management. And hopefully you rely on the fact that good managers see that about you, right? They see that the people below you are doing really well and they don't think it's that they're doing amazingly well, it's that you're managing that process really well. Um, so yeah, I absolutely agree. And, and the other thing I would say is you, you can only control yourselves right so if you're a hiring manager you can't control whether the candidate turns the camera on or not right so um you have to deal with your feelings right how do i feel about this and likewise if you're a candidate you can't control how the manager is going to feel about you having your camera on and off so so manage the process yourself so we set things up when we have conversations um with our candidates we'll prepare them for the interview and part of that will be right are you comfortable uh, being on a video call if you wish to have your camera off ideally we we know that in advance we can tell the client that but also we'd like our candidates to approach the subject oh just so you know i'm doing this or i'm like i couldn't get any time off work so i've like i've come out in my lunch break oh wow it, it turns from this person couldn't make the effort to to find someone somewhere you know in, in an office or something to wow this person's going to spend the whole of their lunch break talking to me instead of going and getting a sandwich right so you can control that narrative but you can only control what you can control so right you've, you've got to do whatever you skip do or you haven't bam but you if you, if you yeah. have you understand yeah just communicate it is that what you're saying sorry <laughs> yeah i just interrupted you that's okay it's all right we've known each other for a long time we do that um so two minutes left which means we've got two minutes for questions sorry. does anybody have questions please Okay. So this gentleman was asking about bullet points on a resume. What works better? Lauren, Kirsten? Um, for bullet points, yes. Have your bullet points. Explain what you've been doing, the impact you've made. I always say if it's a like, we'll say like a waiter, right? Don't put in your bullet points exactly what you do because I know what a waiter does already. Most people know, right? They're greeting customers, seating people, things like that. So write what I don't know about you and what you did. Use those bullets to your advantage and put like those, those achievements, right? The impacts that you've made. Um, but yeah, I always say also most prevalent, right? Like whatever job you have that's most prevalent, do more bullets in those areas. If it's not as relevant, to the position you're applying for, keep it like at three. Can you repeat the question real quick? Oh, uh, what is your feelings on bullet points versus like putting words and commas to save space on it? Okay. Uh, I think like Lauren said, uh, you're, if, remember if you're customizing it per the job, you're comparing it to what, what's being required and you're kind of making, doing a matching game between what's required in the job description and, and what you want to make sure that you highlight. And then another really important point that Chris made, uh, as you start to get to the point where it's too many pages, hope we never get to 17 or 55. Um, <laughs> But that's when you like if you're old as dirt like me, I get, you know, if it was over 20 years ago, I just all I do is list a date range like these things. I even have a section on my resume that says consulted and I don't even list all the co companies I consulted with, <laughs> you know. So you're going to talk about the things that are most relevant and uh, as she sp stated and uh, most recent. Yeah. Uh, what is what is the panel's opinion on, like you said previously, that you want your resume, like you only want to apply for jobs that you are qualified for. How does the panel feel about that when I have heard a lot of people, including recruiters say, if you meet like 60% of what's on the job description, just go ahead and apply. Uh, I'll take that. Um, there are some things that we that we don't have flexibility with. So customer XYZ says these are the requirements, you know, um, they have to have this certification or they don't. This is the part where the recruiter is going to notice that you're close, 
have a conversation with you and be able to speak on your behalf and say things like, in the process of obtaining Security Plus, which is a requirement. In fact, there are moments in the negotiation process where you have been deemed capable of the skills, but you don't have the certification that the customer requires, and your offer could then say, uh, offer you know contingent upon obtaining such and thus a certification within a certain period of time, and the organization will help you with that. So it's going to come down to the conversation, the intake that you know you're talking to Lauren, and she says, uh, and she'll let the hiring manager know too, because she's working on your behalf. She's going to say, although James does not yet have this thing that is required, he's taking his boot camp to get the thing. Does that make sense? Yeah, and you can also put alternatives. So if you've got a job description that says uh, we, 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 it's desirable to have somebody with Splunk, you might want to put, well, I've not used Splunk, but I've used ArcSight, or you know, I've used that. I'm experienced with, I've got four years' experience with another sim. Um, something like that, so that shows, okay, it's probably not going to take too long for you to pick this up. Now, there may be other ones that say you absolutely must have Splunk. In that case, I mean, you, you can still apply it, but you just have to understand that that might be a definitive, like we have one customer that has a really complex uh, Splunk integration and they just, it's too much of a jump for people to come if they've got no experience of it at all. Um, and so for them, it's like a hard yes or no, right? If you've got it, then we'll consider if you haven't, you haven't. So yeah, I would say you can absolutely apply, but just manage your own expectations. Uh, I think people get upset that they're like, well, I had 70% of what was on there, but you had the 70% that was desirable and not the essential. This is also your chance to do that LinkedIn note thing or a cover letter or a cover you know, paragraph that says, notice that I don't have this working on that or I have this equivalent thing, right? Especially if it's a note to the recruiter. I mean, as a recruiter, would you agree if somebody, yeah, uh, this is your opportunity to say, please note, I don't have this thing, I'm aware. So it doesn't look like you weren't paying attention. I'm aware that you need this. Here's why we should have a conversation. And we will try and read all of them. It's like, you know, we, we get a lot of messages. So again, if you don't get the answer the first time, don't give up. Try two or three times. You know, things slip through gaps easily. I think one last question. Um, I've noticed in you guys' talk, you've talked a lot about resumes and the recruiting process and whatnot. One thing that wasn't specifically addressed very, very much was compensation. And I know nobody likes to talk about money, but where do you talk about money in this process and how do you all like to breach that subject? I'm, I think this is more common now, especially in the U.S., but um, first step, right? So I don't want to waste my time as a recruiter and put you through the end, right? If you go through three phases, we've had four weeks of interviewing, and then I go to give you an offer, and I offer you 100000 and you wanted 150. Like, what were we doing, right? So for me, I'm like... The second I get a chance to talk to you, I'm going to check your expectations. Um, sometimes I'll even just send an email and say, hey, this is our range. Does this meet? Yes, it does. Okay, let's now set up a call. Because sometimes even it's a waste of my time to sit and set up a call, chat for 10 minutes, and then find out. It just depends on the recruiter, though, and their volume. Like sometimes I have 20 positions. I'm talking to 40 candidates, 50 candidates a week. An email's easier to check that, but you know it should be in the very beginning of your your process. Um, so I, I know Drake's going to talk about negotiation. Um, there's a lot of things to keep in mind. It's not. It doesn't come down just to a number. There's a lot of other things to keep in mind with the benefits, with the training, and so forth. That I want you to keep. You know keep that, keep flexible with that, right? There's also, and I'm not gonna get it right, there's some kind of new legislation where companies are supposed to put the salary ranges on the job description. However, <laughs> um, be leery of that, and here's what I'm saying. They're never gonna put a salary amount on there that they're not willing to pay. However, it, what they put on there um, I hope I say this right. It, it might not even come close to what you can negotiate. Okay? Oh. Not on purpose. They're not being shady. They're not being weird. But they might, it, it, I think it's, I really think it's state bound. It's how the, it's how the system is even set up. So like for aristocrat, when I enter in like a specific, what we call like a job profile associated with the job, right? It's going to come up with a range. We'll say like literally 80,000 to 150,000. And then on top of that, when it gets posted 
externally for you to see as a candidate, it's also including the bonus. And we do an annual bonus. So a candidate will, like when, when you apply for aristocrat, we actually ask, like, what are your salary expectations? So I know even before I talk to you, a lot of the times it's like $20,000 higher. And when I talk to the candidate, they're like, oh, I just thought this job paid more. And then I have to explain it, right? So like, I hate our system because it does that and it is misleading to candidates. So just keep that in mind. But yes, it's gonna be, usually if you see a range, the lower to like mid range. Um, I, th I think it's called the Transparency Act or something, but it, but it is, okay, Pay Transparency Act, got it. Okay, you're supposed to mouth the answers to me when I can't <laughs> think, but, um, but Pay Transparency Act is, is the companies are, are have to give you, and it, it's, it's location-based. Yeah, like okay? Uh, right, right, Boston, yeah, it's, it's location-based. I'm, I'm trying to tell you not to be afraid, in, in my experience, the range is never going to be... Um, higher than what you can expect, but sometimes it's lower it, because it's not taking in a, to a lot of factors uh, to include if the job posting is tied to whatever location you had to put into your applicant tracking system, but it could be Colorado Springs, but we'll let somebody from New York do it remotely. That's something you're only going to find out when you have the conversation with the recruiter. Plus, it's not including, in our case, sign-on bonuses you know, of up to $20,000. Holy crap, that's not in the range because it's tied to the location. They're, they're, uh, it's, it's automated. We don't even get to decide what we're putting in there. So if you look at it and it even comes close, start having the conversation. Everything's negotiable. Yeah, and, and just, uh, I guess, to sort of tie it off, obviously, I work across multiple clients that do compensation in a way different, you know, from startups that give you equity to companies that don't do bonuses and just bases. Um, like there, there are different ways of doing it now. Just there's a good explanation. Recruiters aren't human resources people. There's a we're very different. A lot of people think that we're HR people. We're not. Um, we might form part of the HR team, um, but we're not HR people. So I, I don't know the legal rules and uh, regulations <laughs> around that stuff. But he's the boss. Say, he doesn't care. He yeah, just do what we're he told. So whatever. Yeah. But, but um, what I will say is some companies include bonuses in those numbers. Some don't. As Kirsten already said, some companies are giving it a wide range where, you know, if you're in San Francisco, you may be able to get the top of the range. Whereas, you know, if you're somewhere else, you may be able to get lower. Now, I'm saying that not because I'm not judging whether you can do the job or not, right? You should all get paid the same. That's not my point. Um, my point with it really is that if you go in and you see that advertised, and you think, like a lot of people do, let's not leave any money on the table. Right, it can go up yeah. to $152,300. Oh, guess what I'm going to put? I'm looking for $152,300, right? And uh, the truth is that they could look at where you are, they could look at other factors, and you might actually get rejected and never get a chance to get a phone call. So just be aware of that. If you are ultimately going to put yourself at the top, and, and don't get me wrong, if you were looking for 170 but you take that, then put yourself at the top. But if you're looking for somewhere in between, work it out be honest with you and as you go through the process you might be able to negotiate a bit more on where you're at you said something very important that i that i want to kind of just highlight um another you're thinking about the cost of benefits and you're thinking about the 401k matching and you're thinking about the training budgets and whether or not they're going to send you to b-sides and pay for it and stuff like that all matters but you mentioned equity um some like you know our company has a thing where you can um you can get a, a discount on purchasing stocks. That's huge. Depending on where you are in your life journey, you care more about things like that. There's companies that have uh, ESOPs and ESPPs. That's also very important, um, and people need to keep that in mind, too. So there's things that are bigger. Um, there's sign-on bonuses. There's shares. There's a lot of uh, different benefits. Make sure you're having that conversation, too. So the, the salary amount, good question. It's just a ball. That's just a starting point, right? Yeah. Get it in, get it in early, and if you want to soften up that that talking about, which some people feel it's easier to soften it up a bit, you know, just going direct in, right? And how much is this paying? And I'm looking for this. Can sometimes can feel a bit aggressive, so um, it's not aggressive. It's something that you have to do. You can practice softening it up. So it might be like, like I'm really driven by this job because I've always wanted to work for Accenture Federal Services, right? Um, I'm a really big fan of Buffalo the casino game. I want to work for an aristocrat, right? So you can soften it up by giving them reasons other than money that you want to work there, but then it, then go into it because it's one of the key things. So there are ways you can soften up, but make sure you have the, the question early because as much as it, it might waste our time or the hiring manager's time, it wastes your time. 
you could be interviewing somewhere else that is going to pay you what you want. So just bear that in mind. And you know how you phrase your answer? Start with these words. Here's the other offers I'm seeing. There we go. Then then. You're a star. Thank Three. you. Go ahead. Sorry. Go on. Do you, do you have more time? <laughs> no, Sorry. Just make up a joke about myself. No, we're good. You should do it. You um, should do it. So we've got Drake on at two. He's going to talk about recruitment-related stuff. You should definitely come back and see that. Hey, you should definitely hang about until two o'clock. Who needs lunch, right? Just hang out. Um, that would be amazing. If anybody's going to DEF CON, I've had the pleasure of talking at Village once, but somebody on this stage is going to be talking on the main stage. Her, not me. <laughs> <laughs> Don't heckle me, please. I'm so nervous. <laughs> um, Thank you very much, Kirsten. Thank you very much, Lauren. You're both absolute stars. I appreciate your time.